All right, so we're gonna get started. We have our first panel already seated and ready to go. The panel participants include the Honorable M. Christine Armijo. She is the Chief Judge here in the District of New Mexico. Judge, um, Honorable Judge Rainer Carlin, again, Chief Judge in the District of Arizona. Honorable Vicki Miles LaGrange, who is not with us, but will be appearing by video. She's from the Western District of Oklahoma. And in her place, I believe, uh, Ms. Susan Otto will be here uh, to answer any questions. Honorable Robert Janelle, a senior judge from the Western District of Texas, and Damon Martinez, a U.S. attorney from the District of New Mexico, the U.S. attorney from the District of New Mexico. So uh, we have uh, four, our four panel uh, committee members to begin our questioning, and we will begin with you, Mr. Kahn. Judge Collins, I'd like to start with you and ask if you could talk a little. You've, you've been a member of the Defender Services Committee for some time, which uh, is chiefly responsible for the administration of the Criminal Justice Act. But things have changed over the last several years. Uh, jurisdiction over staffing has been removed. We've been through sequestration. There's been a new study that now controls the staffing of the defenders uh, nationwide. And I'd like to know if you could talk a little bit about uh, how that's changed the role of the Defender Services and how you feel it's affected your job as a committee member and its ability to, uh, to direct the program and to achieve its aims. Let me say, first of all, I speak for myself and not for the committee as a whole. They haven't, haven't gotten their uh, permission to speak on their behalf. So I'm speaking as a, a judge from Arizona and also I, I am a member of the committee, but I speak for myself. Uh, over the last, I've been on the committee for, um, I guess, five years now. And when I first started with the committee, it was a directorate with the uh, AO, uh, the direct, the, our chair of the committee, uh, our, our, the one with Kate Clark now has a position, but, but the, her predecessor was a director. And now she is a more like a department head. Um, and that has had some interesting uh, aspects to it. It takes a little bit longer now to get some answers about what things are going to be and things such as that. Having the budget now being primarily run by judicial resources has been also something that's very interesting. Um, we spend our time learning and knowing what happens in the Federal Public Defender's Office and what happens in the CJA. To give you an example, several, two years ago, a year and a half ago, we were able to look at our experience and know that if we did not cut the rate for CJA lawyers, uh, that if you just wait till the end of the year, more than likely the numbers would balance out and that the lawyers would, would still get the money that they were entitled. Instead, it was uh, over our head, was done, that the rate was cut, and uh, lo and behold, we had money to pay the lawyers the rate uh, at the end of the year as we thought we would have. So those type of things have happened over the last couple of years. And now uh, the budgetary process has now become more about numbers than, than anything else, and that makes it very, very uh, exasperating. I think I understand some of your exasperation. Do you have, I mean, so you've been looked at the, the you know, the, the, the Criminal Justice Act from the perspective of a member of the Defender Services Committee for a while now. Do you have any thoughts on ways in which the structure could be improved to allow better administration? Two thoughts about that. Number one, I've heard people talk about having uh, the CJA Act and federal defenders of it be a standalone organization. And I'm not sure I'm in favor of that because if they have to go to Congress themselves and carry their own water to get their budget, I'm not sure they're going to get the budgets they're used to getting that, that they've gotten in the past. That, that's my worry. But I do think that we could set up a system where um, there could be a, a plank, so to speak, under, under the judiciary, but there'd be a plank where it's separately administered by people who have. Uh, more knowledge about federal public defenders and CJA, more knowledge about how cases go, more knowledge about what's reasonable and what's not, things such as that. And I think there's a separate, there's a way you could set up a separate system where it could be administered while there'd be an overall AO head. Uh, it could be administered separately and rather than having, for instance, when we do a voucher review at this point in time, you know, there are over 600 district court judges that review vouchers, not counting magistrate judges, and they all do it their own different way. There's no one way that everybody does it. Those type of things could be uh, more streamlined and more uh, uniform. Do you see centralizing those functions, the voucher review functions? I would love to see that. I'd love to take myself, judge, out of 
<laughs> I understand. I don't want to take up all the time. Well, and that, let me say this. Um, I know that each of you have prepared written statements, um, and so I would like to give you the opportunity to present um, from each of your perspectives. Um, I think that'll help in asking some of the questions. Uh, each of you the opportunity uh, to go ahead and present your statements or any kind of opening <laughs> remarks that you would like to make. So let's start with you, uh, Chief Judge Armijo. Did you have a, a pre prepared statement or a statement you'd like to make an opening? Yes, I do. Thank you, and welcome to the District of New Mexico, Thank everybody. You. Sorry about the weather today, but <laughs> we, we need the moisture. Uh, in, in reviewing the criteria here that was uh, sent uh, by the committee, uh, I identified uh, three areas that I think are crucial, uh, as I see it. One is training. Uh, training not only in terms of skills or enhancing skills of the attorneys, but uh, training in, in this loosely described term of uh, cultural sensitivity. New Mexico, as I noted in my written statement, is the fifth largest state geographically in our United States, but it's uh, one of the smallest in terms of population. And uh, so a vast uh, majority of our population is a rural population. And within uh, the District of New Mexico, the state of New Mexico, we have 19 independent Indian Pueblos. We have two Apache uh, tribes and part of the Navajo Reservation uh, on the west side of the state. Uh, many languages are spoken uh, here, uh, other than English and other than Spanish. Our court has uh, a certified uh, uh, Navajo interpreter, certainly uh, several certified Spanish interpreters. Uh, I, as a jurist, have been challenged on more than one occasion in criminal cases where uh, we have uh, criminal defendants who uh, request uh, an interpreter, but yet it is not Navajo and is obviously not Spanish. And uh, uh, we often have used uh, lay people who have volunteered uh, that both sides have agreed to uh, uh, to be able to perform that function. But uh, uh, to come to court for the first time in that role uh, is very intimidating as it would be to a juror for the first time or a witness in a case. And uh, I have reached out to the uh, University of New Mexico Law School and specifically have had a conversation with uh, Professor Barbara Creel, who's going to be here uh, tomorrow and, and will address this uh, committee. Uh, she's with the uh, Indigenous Peoples Program at the law school, formerly the, the law, Indian Law Center, and suggested that perhaps uh, uh, in a collaborative effort with the court and our court interpreters, uh, supervisors, that we uh, train people there. Uh, give them some basic training about what it is like to be in a courtroom, uh, to be in that kind of environment, so that when the time comes uh, to utilize uh, a person who is a non-certified uh, person but used in the role of interpreter, that that person will be much more comfortable and be able to do that job. That is a challenge here in the District of New Mexico. The other point of this is, is quite interesting. Uh, uh, our interpreters... Uh, uh, the Spanish interpreters are, are posed, they're posed with very unique challenges in folks that uh, come across the border in criminal proceedings. And I can remember a lesson uh, taught me, and it was uh, 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 a gentleman who had come over and he was caught stealing cattle. And uh, uh, for some reason it wound up in federal court, in our Las Cruces court. And he was a Tatahumata Indian from uh, the mountainous region of Mexico. Uh, could not understand why that was a crime. Because in his culture, everyone owns animals in common, right? It's just part of the right of nature. And it was a very difficult uh, uh, challenge to be able to work with this person to convince him that here, that is a crime for which you can be punished and potentially very severely. So I think that cultural sensitivity uh, oftentimes is, is something that is needed with respect to uh, many of our, our defendants who have uh, crossed the border, but also with respect to our Native American community. And I say that uh, uh, based on a lesson that I learned. Professor Creel asked me to speak at a seminar that uh, she put together last year, and it was a seminar for lawyers actually taught by, court, by uh, interpreters, not the other way around. And she brought together a, a very diverse group of uh, interpreters who actually spoke uh, based on their unique one-on-one -on -one relationship with their various clients or the defendants over the course of time, and how important it is to be able to understand so much more than just the, the statute. 
all right, in terms of uh, assisting that person in understanding uh, why it is he or she is before the court. And so the, the term cultural sensitivity came to mind, and I think that we can do a better job perhaps reaching out to, uh, to the law school. The other area that I wanted to address is mentorship. Uh, uh, shortly after I became chief, I uh, uh, put myself on the uh, CJA uh, committee along with one other judge, and we've made some changes, and I think they've been good changes. They've been well received, and one of the things that has been noticed is that uh, attorneys who potentially are very capable lack the, the expertise in the courtroom with more seasoned attorneys and they are on our panel. And I would like us to see a way to initiate uh, an informal mentorship program so that uh, someone with uh, uh, not a great deal of trial experience, courtroom experience, can uh, uh, be mentored by someone who has that experience. I think it would overall enhance the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, performance, the, the value of the attorney in the courtroom. And the third area is a need for more federal public defenders. We uh, survived sequestration somewhat. Uh, our courthouse doors never closed. Uh, we as a district did not have to uh, furlough anyone, but I know the public defenders suffered greatly. The U.S. Attorney's Office, Mr. Martinez's office, was impacted severely, as was the United States Marshal. Uh, our public defender, Stephen McHugh, announced uh, a week ago that the Judicial Conference had approved 14 new positions in the District of New Mexico, and we are very optimistic that he will fill each of those positions, but I sense that there may be some hesitancy on his part because of the fear of another sequestration and the fear of having to then perhaps furlough people or even let people go. But the need is great, and I hope that uh, whatever can be done to encourage uh, stability and ensure that uh, when you're given 14 new slots or 10 new slots or six, that indeed when you uh, make those appointments, that those are folks that are going to be available to, uh, uh, to serve uh, uh, our defendants. So those are the, the three areas. I think training uh, in the area of mental health is ex just a bottom line to me is the, the, the basis of so many of our problems in the District of New Mexico. Uh, the uh, Department of Justice right now is monitoring the Albuquerque Police Department uh, because of very severe problems. Uh, many of those cases have come to federal court. And what we have found as a district is that, especially with respect to our Native American community, there are significant mental health issues uh, that are there despite the, uh, uh, the behaviors uh, that, that uh, bring someone to court. The PowerPoint that I will not show here, but is in written form, uh, I chose because I want you to understand what it is like in the District of New Mexico, not just a border district, but a district that has a very, uh, a very beautiful, very uh, wonderful Native American population, but we also have the challenges that come with uh, the ruralness of our of our district. Thank you, Judge uh, Chief Judge Collins. Did you have a statement? Well, I will say this: uh, as I indicated, uh, I speak as a, as a, for my, on my own behalf and not uh, behalf of anybody else. I'm in the Ninth Circuit, as you all may know, and I think that's a very unique circuit, and we have some very unique. Um, jurisdictions in the uh, the Ninth Circuit. In Arizona, we have some of the same issues with Native Americans, we have the same issues with Spanish speakers, and we have so many dialects that come through, Treaky, Chol, and things such as that. I've been dreading a trial I suppose to have in December with a Chol interpreter who only happens to speak Spanish herself. So it's gonna be from English to Spanish to Chol, Chol to Spanish to English. And that was going to be very difficult. I just got told today it's planned out. So I'm very happy about that. But uh, I think that the overall, the federal public defender system itself is a good one. I think that the AO does a pretty good job of making sure the funds go where they're supposed to go. I think over in the past few years, they did a very good job walking federal public defenders through their budgetary process and was able to hold their hands if needed be. Uh, I think now with what's happened with the judicial resources taking over uh, primarily the budgetary function and things such as that. I'm not sure that that knowing a particular uh, defender's office is, is going to carry through, and I think that's something that we've lost that we need to get back. Um, I think that the federal public defender, if I had my choice, I'd have every case handled by someone from the federal public defender's office. Why? They're consistent. They may not be flashy. They may not be a racehorse hand, so to speak, but they're always good. They're always do a very, very good job, and they always know what's happening in the courthouse. CJA counsel, they also work very hard, but sometimes 
the difference between one CJA lawyer and another can be stark sometimes. Um, you have some CJA lawyers who read every word and every document on every page. You have some who glance on and look for their defendant's name. You have some who seem never to visit their client more than once or twice. Some who seem like they're out there every day. And that's always a very unique challenge for a judge to make a decision about whether or not when you get down to paying a voucher, uh, what's been done has been reasonable and necessary in any particular case. Uh, I think that the system suffers when judges have an ability in a case they really don't know that much about to determine how much CGA counsel is going to get paid um, uh, at, the, at the end of the day. And I think that has unique uh, aspects sometimes of how, how a lawyer does their work, uh, trying to determine whether or not if I do this, if I do that, am I going to get paid by the judge at the end of the day. Now, thankfully, most of the lawyers do the work they think is necessary anyway. Uh, that's very thankful that they do that. But the other thing I would say uh, in opening remarks is this. Um, judges as, as a whole don't get trained on how to review vouchers. We all come with our own nature about how things should be. If we represented people in the past, great. If we didn't, we try and learn on the, on the fly. And those things may become very, very difficult for the defense counsel, particularly CJA, to put on a good defense. Now, the federal public defenders has their own budget. They can pay their own experts. They can hire the people they think that they need. But a CJA lawyer has to come to the judge, usually the judge who handles that same very case. And they have to say, judge, I need so much money for an expert. And the judge says, that's too much money. Find a cheaper expert. And I think that has a great impact on sometimes the overall uh, uh, amount of justice that can be entered. And if it gets frustrating because most of our cases, you all know, end in change of police. So for a, a lawyer to work for four or five months on a case and then submit a bill for thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars dollars $50,000 and it results in a change of plea, sometimes judges' eyebrows go up when that happens. So I think that there should be a way that we can do a system where we take the judges out of the review process, take them out of the expert appointing process also. Those are my opening remarks. Judge Janelle? Well, thank you for coming out to the Southwest. And even though I'm from Texas, I went to school at New Mexico Military Institute here in Roswell. My parents said something about the word incorrigible as they dropped me off there. <laughs> but, um, as a senior judge of the United States District Court for the Western District of Texas, uh, and by the way, I've had no one nominated to replace me yet in my other, uh, in my judgeship, I serve in the second largest district in the United States. I have been the only presiding judge for the Midland Odessa Division and the Pecos Division for almost 13 years. The biggest issue that we have out here and one that makes us unique is that in the Pecos Division, it is larger in land than 11 states. That's one division. Uh, it is half as large as 31 states and larger than 60 judicial districts, as well as having a 500-mile border with Mexico. This is one division, not a district. Uh, the distances within the division create serious obstacles for litigants, participants, and the overall due process in the federal court. Uh, as we say, there's not a lot of people that live out in West Texas, but there's a lot of people coming and going. And when you have two interstate high highways going through the Pecos Division and a 500-mile border with uh, Mexico, uh, it creates a lot of traffic uh, primarily in the drug trade and illegal aliens coming in, coming into the country. Um, the vast geography that comprises the Pecos Division and the resulting impact of that physical location to Mexico is a significant fa factor. Uh, in the statistics for 2014 calendar year, both the Midland Odessa Division and the Pecos Division, uh, we had 776 criminal cases in those two divisions combined 1,032 criminal defendants, and I'm the only judge for those two right there. Uh, I've tried 382 jury trials uh, since I came on the bench in 2012, and the majority about, I didn't go back and count that, you know, what the division was, but the majority, vast majority of them are criminal cases. Uh, Defendants are kept in several county jails spread across the division, which causes another issue in transportation, getting both the defendants to the courthouses, but also for the lawyers to see. There are only 20 lawyers on the CJA panel for the Pecos division. Out of the 20, only one lives in Pecos. Nine are spread throughout the division, and 10 live in practice in the Midland Odessa division, which is approximately 100 miles east of Pecos. 
We have four lawyers that live in Alpine, Texas, which are our federal public defender's office. Most of the defendants are Spanish speaking, which adds even more demands on defense counsel. Uh, Judge Orlando Garcia is going to testify tomorrow, uh, who's in the Western District of Texas out of San Antonio. And one of the things that he says is, I urge and I agree with him. I urge the commission to avoid a general one size fits all prescription for reform. What works in Philadelphia will not work in Pecos, Texas. What works in Pecos, Texas will not work in Los Angeles, California. It is just so, the, the practice is different just because of the size, the geographical area and, and, and what we have and the type of cases that we work on and that we have available for lawyers that are available. Um, I would also urge the commission to focus on practical solutions to the problems we face, which I know you will. And these can make a real dif difference in the defense of thousands of individual defendants. And I've attached a number of, of exhibits just kind of showing statistics and maps and things of that. But, you know, when a lawyer's got to travel uh, two or three hours to get to the courthouse, which can, which can occur, uh, it's, it, it's, it's tough. And uh, we talked about, you know, I look at all these bills. I've not had any trouble. I, I don't know. Maybe the lawyers just don't say it to me. But uh, the, the only problems I have with with bills uh, for the lawyers and for their uh, for, for paying them for their work is um, in habeas capital cases. Which, being in Texas, we have a lot of capital cases, and that's where I've seen the real issue coming up. And of course, we our report court gets graded by the Fifth Circuit because there's a judge of the Fifth Circuit that reviews those as well. But that's where the real issue has occurred is on habeas cases you know, for me uh, personally and dealing with those and expenses for those cases. I, I, I'm going to throw an idea out. and It may have some value, it may not. And being someone that's um, where expenses are not very high, but hours are a lot, is that, you know, we have different hours for judges for per diems when we go from one town to another town to another town to do. I mean, the per diem. Um, in Santa Fe, I would think it's higher than the Peridium in Pecos is. And there's a reason, because people have looked at that cost in doing that. Uh, I would suggest that those costs, uh, you know, doing the practice may be more, it may be higher in Washington, D.C. than it is in Midland, Texas, or Pecos, Texas, or something like that. And that's an idea that someone might want to throw around to look at that. But again, my big wish is that it's not a one-size-fits-all because uh, our courts are not one-size-fits-all. Mr. Martin. Your Honor, thank you. And uh, members of the committee, I want to thank you for the privilege to be able to speak before you this afternoon. And uh, as a chief judge has already said, welcome to New Mexico. Uh, Your Honor, I do have a prepared statement that I would like to read at this point. The uh, U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of New Mexico appreciates the work the committee is doing to ensure that the CGA program provides financially eligible federal criminal defendants with effective representation. Given the specific characteristics and circumstances of each judicial district, district courts need flexibility in the way that they administer the CGA program and address specific issues in their districts. To that end, we appreciate the committee's efforts to engage in an open dialogue with the U.S. attorneys on the effectiveness of the programs in their districts by inviting us to testify at field hearings such as this one. After speaking to prosecutors at the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the District of New Mexico, we offered the following thoughts on three issues. First, the vetting process for the appointment of attorneys. Second, the process by which retained counsel may la later receive court appointment, and third, e-discovery. We recognize, of course, that the courts have responsibility for and control over the CGA program, and we make these suggestions in a spirit of cooperation and collaboration. So first, the vetting process. As the committee is well aware, the continued vitality of the CGA program is directly dependent upon a selection process that ensures both a diverse and well-qualified panel of attorneys. This is particularly true in New Mexico where the federal judiciary is called upon to hear a wide and unique range of criminal cases. 
The docket in the District of New Mexico includes not only those matters that form the core of a federal criminal practice, white collar, public corruption, national security, to name just three, but it also includes a robust immigration, Indian country, and narcotics practice. This far-reaching mission mandates that the CJA panel be well-versed in divergent areas of law, the sum total of which is sui generis to New Mexico. It is not just the cases that make this district unique. New Mexico is a land with a diverse, multicultural population, all of whom celebrate firmly rooted traditions steeped in a rich history. The CJA panel can and should reflect the demographics of the people it was created to represent. To accomplish these intertwined goals, the U.S. Attorney's Office recommends that the vetting process should include input from all parts of the court community, including the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Office of the Federal Public Defender, the U.S. Marshal Service, and the U.S. Probation Office, in order to give the court a well-rounded assessment of a candidate attorney's qualifications. The qualifications the court should focus on should include, but not necessarily be limited to, the candidate's federal court experience, trial experience in general, ethics, integrity, and client service. Similarly, rigorous review processes are critical for the periodic reassessment of CGA attorney's performance and continued participation on the panel. The committee may wish to consider a system of tiered levels of re renewal where, for example, Attorneys with the highest rating are renewed for three years. Attorneys with an average rating are renewed for two years. And the attorneys with the lowest acceptable rating are renewed for a year. The second point, the court appointment of previously retained attorneys. The U.S. Attorney's Office recommends that the committee examine how a retained attorney may later, when appropriate, receive a CJA appointment in a particular case. In some cases in the District of New Mexico and around the country, Private defense attorneys that requested an initial retainer from a defendant exhausted those funds quickly and then sought appointment under the Criminal Justice Act on the grounds that the client was now indigent. This scenario can serve to erode public confidence in the criminal justice system. Poor appearances aside, this can be problematic if it allows a retained attorney to jump the line and receive a court appointment in a specific case. In more cases than, than other similarly qualified CJA attorneys, or in a case where the attorney is not on the CJA panel. Moreover, depending on the size of the initial retainer, this practice may also lead to compensation that significantly exceeds the CJA rate over a life of a case. Third point, e-discovery. The evolution of federal litigation has witnessed an exponential increase in the volume of discovery in many cases. This in turn has fed the need for U.S. attorney's offices to turn e-discovery to help manage the sometimes overwhelming quantity of discovery associated with some cases. On top of that, the Department of Justice has recently enacted new encryption protocols that dictate how electronic discovery can be distributed to defense attorneys. With this in mind, a practice the committee may want to share with the courts is the use of a court-appointed discovery coordinator in cases with a high volume of discovery. Such a, such a coordinator can assist the CJA attorneys in handling discovery, especially e-discovery, reduce the need for CJA attorneys to rely on the government for technical assistance, and most importantly, provide the defense with a central line of communication with respect to discovery in large cases. Any such coordinator should be skilled in using discovery software and processing various media for viewing, downloading, and duplicating electronic files. Your Honor, in conclusion, I very much appreciate the opportunity to share my office's thoughts and suggestions on the CGA program and issues that significantly impact a defendant's right to effective representation in our criminal justice system. This concludes my statement. Thank you. All right, I believe we have Judge Miles LaGrange by video, and so if you'll give us just a second, I think we're going to hook that up and so we can all uh, watch her comments. Good afternoon. My name is Chief Judge Vicki Miles LaGrange of the Western District of Oklahoma. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to speak with you about the Criminal Justice Act. 
My experience with the CJA began when I served as United States Attorney for the Western District of Oklahoma. I saw firsthand the importance of having qualified counsel available to represent indigent defendants who were facing criminal charges that carried significant terms of imprisonment and the loss of civil rights. As of the 28th of this month, I have served for 21 years as a United States District Judge for the Western District of Oklahoma. My tenure as the Chief Judge ends this month. As a judge, and especially as the Chief Judge, I have experienced the Criminal Justice Act at work, both in the federal prosecutions and the federal habeas corpus review component of our state capital habeas cases. During sequestration, our court continued to function despite the lapse in funding for the Federal Public Defender Office, in part because the lawyers volunteered their service without pay to address the funding shortfall. The CJA panel attorneys continue to serve through payment suspensions that occur with unfortunate frequency. Adequately funding the defense function on the large national scale and in individual cases is crucial to enforcing a constitutional right to counsel recognized by Gideon. The necessity and value of the Criminal Justice Act system is really beyond question. The question moving forward is how to make the system better. My comments today are focused on the interface between the judiciary and the administration of the Criminal Justice Act. In the Western District, we have a traditional federal public defender office and two separate panels of CJA counsel. One for the regular district court cases and one for the capital habeas cases. Finding and retaining a highly qualified group of attorneys to serve on these panels depends on four fundamental elements. First, adequate funding for both counsel and supportive expert and other services. Second, prompt payment of claims without inappropriate voucher cutting. Third, an appointment system that ensures the attorneys are appointed often enough to cases they are well qualified to take. And fourth, training that helps the attorneys stay current with the law and related areas. Judicial officers are involved directly in the first two elements of the system. While oversight and accountability are important, we should consider delegating approval of case budgets, of request for expert and other services, and approval of interim and final voucher payments to a judicial officer other than the judge presiding over the case. We have just such a case budgeting system in place for our capital habeas corpus cases. Insulating the judge who will hear the case from the monetary aspects of the case could have several positive consequences. For example, 
the attorney requesting expert and other services would not have to discuss defense strategies with the judge who will hear the case. Requiring the attorney and the judge to carry on these conversations places both parties in a, an awkward position. An attorney might be dissuaded from requesting funds and a judge might be dissuaded from approving the use of funds out of concern the, that the investigation will not yield useful evidence or out of concern about the national budget or simply because such there is no precedent in the jurisdiction for such a request. Discouraging advocacy by withholding necessary funds is contrary to the history and the purpose of the Criminal Justice Act. Asking a judicial officer who will not be deciding the merits of the case to consider these requests will promote the independence of the defense function by adding a buffer between the presiding judge and the advocate. Judicial officers who engage in similar case budgeting develop an expertise that benefits both the court and the advocates. By engaging in the process of approval before the expenditure is incurred, the chance of unwarranted reductions in vouchers at the end of the case is reduced dramatically, if not removed altogether. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the goal of equal access to justice will be advanced by establishing a system that allocates funds fairly and responsibly. We should consider an amendment to the Criminal Justice Act that separates the monetary components of representation from the judicial officer deciding the merits of the case. If an amendment to the Act is not feasible, we should, admin, we should amend the Guide to Judiciary Policies and the Model CJA Plan to provide a framework for local action by the districts. Each district should be free to choose the system that works best for everyone. But a system that separates these components is essential. The independence of the Federal Defender Office is also critically important. While district judges do not control the financial issues of the Defender Offices, we are certainly involved in the initial decision to create an office and in the appointment and reappointment of the Defender. It would be extremely destructive for a district court to become involved in the day-to-day -day functioning of a Defender Office or to attempt to control who is appointed as the head of the office. By the same token, it's important to have a structure that allows the system to address legitimate problems promptly and effectively. The Administrative Office of the United States Courts has the capacity to provide that necessary structure. A division of the AO devoted exclusively to the Defender Services Program and the Defender Services Committee have existed for decades. Recent reorganizations have divided some of the functions of the administrative staff and reduced the degree of autonomy of the Defender Services Committee. The original model that capitalized on the expertise of the Defender Services staff 
and the oversight of the Defender Services Committee should be restored and expanded. That structure secures the independence of the Defender Offices, fiscal responsibility, and full accountability. Our local ship solution should be our reference point. The Defender Services Office should serve as the buffer between the Defender Offices and the courts, devising and implementing a system capable of securing adequate funding and resources for the offices, ensuring accountability, and providing support to both the offices and the courts when and as issues arise. The Criminal Justice Act system is a powerful framework within which indigent defense services are delivered every day. The courts, the defendants, the lawyers, and the public have been well served by this system. With just some fine tuning that reflects our accumulated experience, we can secure this system for decades to come. Thank you very much. All right, with all of the opening statements now being made, I'm going to turn it over to Judge Walton for any question he may have. Um, Chief Judge Emilio, you indicated that greater diversity is needed among uh, interpreters because of the diverse population that you have in the District of New Mexico. Do you have the same concerns in reference to the attorneys who represent uh, this same population? Well, I agree that the uh, attorney population should be representative, obviously, of the, uh, of the people that we serve. There's no question about that. Um, it's a difficult question to answer because uh, statistically, I think about 50% of our uh, appointments are to the uh, panel members, 50% to the uh, Federal Public Defender's Office. Um, two months ago, there were two representatives from Defender Services who visited our district, and I met with them, as did my clerk of court and, uh, and others. And uh, it was expressed to me uh, their surprise that there wasn't a larger population uh, or percentage of, uh, uh, of those defendants uh, being served by the Federal Public Defender's Office. And they thought 50% uh, for the panel was extremely high based on, I guess, their knowledge of other districts uh, around uh, the United States. I am hoping that uh, with 14 new potential appointments here with our federal public defender that uh, that those appointments will be made and that most of those will be attorneys. Uh, some will have to be support staff, obviously. Uh, but I do think that uh, uh, diversity absolutely is a criteria. We need to reflect uh, uh, in the work we do the, the people that we serve. There's no question about that. Um, related to that, however, I think is the question of training and how do we as a profession, really, recruit uh, and train uh, folks. And that's why mentorship to me is important, that concept of mentorship. Because in our district, we have really a select few attorneys that will handle the complex cases and generally the major felony, general felony cases. And you have uh, attorneys that want to practice. They have the, the, the talent, but they don't have the experience. And I think mentorship is, is one way to do that and try to uh, build that into the into the system. Um, Mr. Martinez, one of the complaints you frequently hear in reference to the adequacy of representation of people who can't afford to hire their own lawyers is that the government has unequal resources. And as a result of that, uh, defendants who have to try and operate within the system are at a, at a distinct disadvantage. Do you think that's true here in New Mexico? Your Honor, um, respectfully, I disagree with that. 
state. Um, <clears throat> I've been in this position for less than two years now, but over the time period that I've been sitting in the seat of the U.S. Attorney for the District of New Mexico, it's been a con constant balancing act yes. of where we're putting resources within our office. Whether here in New Mexico, we, we have a border obligation. We have 180 miles of uh, common border with Mexico, so we have immigration cases. We have two national security lab or two national labs, Sandia Los Alamos. So we have national security cases concerns. Uh, unfortunately, um, our statistics for 2013 is we were found to be the second most violent uh, violent state in the nation per capita. And then I believe in 2012, uh, we were up, unfortunately up there leading the uh, addiction uh, people who died of overdoses with heroin and uh, opiate or uh, prescription drug overdoses. So in dealing with, and also I'm not addressing Indian country, in dealing with what we have to deal with from a prosecutor's perspective, we don't have enough resources. For example, with Indian country, our resources are stretched thin. Uh, Chief Judge Armijo already talked about um, we have 22 Native American tribes here in New Mexico. For the most part, most of them are very small, and they don't have the infrastructure to have their own criminal justice systems. So in essence, what has happened is our, our uh, Native American Indian Crime Section serves as a DA's office. We're taking those cases that we otherwise wouldn't take. And in a state that like New Mexico, that is large in area, our prosecutors are constantly traveling throughout the state, and their workload, their caseload is uh, incredible. So um, I'm speaking for the U.S. Attorney's Office, but I would also speak for the other federal law enforcement agencies, such as FBI or DEA or ATF that I'm thinking of. It's a constant, they're constantly trying to prioritize to try to figure out which are the main concerns that we have to deal with at any one moment, Your Honor? Judge, may I follow up on something Mr. Martinez said? Uh, New Mexico, the District of New Mexico has uh, the highest number, at least last year, I think that statistic is still there, highest number of defendants, uh, sex offenders under supervision nationally. Um, the juvenile facility uh, that we uh, are very proud of, uh, AMI Kids, uh, uh, because we do have a small juvenile docket, the great majority of the uh, young men there are sex offenders. That is something that is a, a terrible statistic for this district. Mental health, again, is one of the underlying issues in virtually every criminal case that we have, primarily those out of Indian country and especially our, our small juvenile population. Chief Judge Collins, you raised the concern that tends to be universal based upon what we heard from others who submitted written uh, comments or proposed testimony, and that is that judges who are assigned uh, to cases should not be reviewing and approving vouchers. Uh, judge Miles LaGrange suggested that maybe it should be another judge who's not assigned to the case. I don't know if you think that's an acceptable model, and if not, then what would be an acceptable model, and do you think that would, would be palatable with Congress, that they would be willing to take that responsibility from the judges and give it to some third party? I'm not sure that Congress would be willing to do that, unfortunately. Uh, but I do think what Judge LaGrange said has some merit to it. Uh, at least having someone further removed from the process would, would be helpful. But I, there are some districts where the P federal public defender reviews the voucher, and the judge is not involved other than signing the voucher. I think a system like that could be set up, and that would be even take the judge further out of the system that way. So I think it, there's a way to do it. Uh, but I, I think a system that the, the judge who presides over the case determines what expert is hired, how much someone is paid, I think that's a, a system fraught with problems. But I, I do think Judge LaGrange, uh, at least removing the presiding judge from it, is a, a step in the right direction. But I would move it even further and maybe have the Federal Public Defender's Office review those vouchers and just send it to the judge for signature. Judge Goldberg. Just a uh, follow-up and to play devil's advocate a little bit, isn't the, the trial judge in the best position to determine 
what went on in the courtroom and thus what's fair or not fair by way of the voucher as opposed to a public defender who didn't sit in the courtroom and didn't understand how, let's say, for instance, difficult the client was. So well, how, how The judge isn't going to know how difficult the client was either when it's all said and done. And the judge only see what happens in the courtroom. There's a lot that goes, most of the case happens outside of the courtroom, away from the judge's eyes. And frankly, when a judge hasn't been trained to be a defense lawyer, never tried a defense case in their life, but now they're put in a position of trying to determine how much money someone should get paid. That's not fair to the judge. It's not fair to the litigant either. And, you know, I, I, I love all my brethren, but some of them tried cases when, judges, when lawyers got $25 an hour, and they think that was a great amount of money to get, and they think it's too much now to pay somebody $125 an hour. So I think... Taking the judges out of the system would be a very, very good step. I, you know, seeing the case and having it tried in front of you doesn't give you any expertise about what's appropriate to pay someone in that particular case. It just Chief, doesn't. Chief Judge Collins, I won't follow up and ask you to <clears throat> comment on <laughs> the observations of the circuit judge who you know, are also in positions who... Uh, to, to well, review. I'll be I'll be glad to say I think you should take them out of the process too. <laughs> that you put them even 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 in a worse position because they're the, they're depending on the trial judge to say it was an extraordinary case in the first place and then take a look at a bill so far removed it's, it's definitely unfair at that point. I, I want to ask a, a, a I think more of a philosophical question but I think circles back to the issue of vouchers that has been brought up already. We've had. In our hearings, and we've heard the term used, I don't know, 10, 10 times already. We've been talking about it a lot, particularly voucher cutting. Uh, Chief Judge Miles LaGrange said, and I, I wrote, I paraphrase, I'm paraphrasing what she said. It was very eloquent, I thought. She said, discouraging the use of funds to defend the indigent goes directly against the core of the Criminal Justice Act. Um, I have a a circuit case here, I won't say from which circuit it is, it's not from any of your circuits, so feel free to comment on it. On it. And the essence of it, uh, my fair summary, I think, is that uh, it says that CJA representation should be in part pro bono. And the, the passage I want to read and then ask everyone to comment on it, um, it says, I'm quoting, but it must be remembered that CJA service is first a professional responsibility, and no lawyer is entitled to full compensation for services. And then it goes on to use the words pro bono a lot. So I think we have two different philosophies, and this goes right to the heart of, I think, voucher cutting. Um, Judge Miles LaGrange saying we should not be uh, stingy in any respect on, on defending the indigent and this case says, well, it could be pro bono work. So I'd be curious to hear what you folks think about that. My initial comment would be, when you're only paying 125 bucks an hour, it's already part pro bono. <laughs> uh, it's already that. It's better than 25. It's better than 25 dollars an hour. That's true. It's already pro bono. And to ask the lawyer to volunteer their time and, and their efforts in some of the very serious cases that we have is totally unfair. It's unfair to the lawyers, unfair to the, to the litigant. The way, our system, the way cases have, tr have changed over the years, they have just, they're more complex. Uh, there are more ways you can get in trouble with the law in the first place. There's, there's thousands of statutes out there now. And to have a lawyer volunteer their time to be well versed about trying a particular case with some particular statute, I don't think that's a fair result at all. I just don't think it's possible. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with reading the vouchers. I've not. Um, there have been a few occasions, and the way it works in the Western District of Texas, and Judge Cardone, correct me if I don't have this exactly right, but they go. To, the voucher goes to our uh, district office, and then they look to see if the, if the right rate is charged. If and things of that nature, technical sort of things that are there. And then they come to the judge. And in that case, uh, the, the attorney has an opportunity to object if there was something done to the voucher, I guess, by uh, accounting, which I've never had that occur. And it's in the only, again, uh, 
I probably had as many cases as anybody here and just not had any problems with it. And I think we may want to have a, a way to review it uh, if, or a way to object to it uh, to the judges looking at that that might be a little bit more systematic, but we just, I just haven't had the problem. In, in reading the report, I was really surprised uh, from, from the National Association there. Uh, it just hadn't been a, it has not been an issue. You know, with uh, <clears throat> sequester, uh, with, I think, just difficult economic circumstances consistently in our country at this point, I pose the question, what, what does it mean to perform pro bono work? You know, uh, there are many attorneys that have expressed that uh, the CJA work is their bread and butter. And I think it is for the most part, at least in our, in our district. So I pose the question, do you, do you uh, try to increase the, the panel size so that uh, you have more uh, attorneys available and, and available for uh, appointment? Uh, or do you shrink that? and concentrate the, the appointments in the hands of a very few. And those are conversations that have been talked about, I think, uh, on our committee at, at, at times. On the one hand, uh, you concentrate, you have probably better experienced attorneys. Uh, on the other hand, when you have a greater pool out there, you're going to have less appointments. So you don't have the opportunity to, to enhance your skills. And I go back to this whole notion of mentorship. I don't have an, uh, an answer to the question, but I, I tend to agree generally with, uh, with uh, Judge Collins here. You know, um, having a CJA panel that de depends on their living getting court-appointed cases is fraught with its own peril, too. Yeah. Uh, I think that, that lawyers who are on the panel should have a diverse book of business, so to speak, and they shouldn't just be trying only doing CJA work. I think... You get a better lawyer, you get a better prepared lawyer, and the client gets a better result if that lawyer is doing other things also. To have 100% of their time devoted to CJA work and not be a member of the Federal Public Defender's Office, I think, has its own issues. Uh, Judge Janelle, just to follow up, I personally, if, if I don't look at another voucher, that would be, oh, be, exactly. be, yes. be fine with me. Uh, do you... Do you ever engage in uh, reducing vouchers? I mean, you've had so many cases, and if you do, uh, do you bring in the attorneys and let them comment on, on what you're going to do or, or propose to do? I have rarely had voucher that went over the amount. I mean, if it's within the amount that's, that's authorized, I don't go back in and say, well, you know, you really shouldn't have spent 45 minutes with that person, it should have only been 10. I, I don't, I never do that. I mean, first of all, I don't have time to go in and do that. And, and the second thing is, is that I'm trying to go back and remember when I've cut a voucher, yes, I've called the lawyer and said, but all of these are done after the case is through. I mean, this is not done while the case is going on. I've had lawyers come and ask for uh, uh, appointment of experts. We follow our circuit rule on doing that. Yes, you can have an expert. Here's the amount that is allowed for that expert. Uh, and I, I'm sure there's been a time that I've denied one. I don't recall any. Uh, so I don't want to say yes. I've, you know, I've never denied an expert, but um, I don't recall any. And again, we have an amount, Judge Cordone, I can't remember exact, the exact amount that's on there, but there's a, a circuit rule on what we have. Uh, on there, and then there's a circuit judge, I think, that reviews that if there gets to be an issue. My big issue, again, has been in habeas capital murder cases, and that's the one where um, it's, it's, it's been more problematic for me than the cases that are... What have been the problem? Uh, getting experts to go back on M mental retardation or mental, mental health issues that have been there, um, ballistics experts, and the, again, these are cases that were tried in the state court, have been through state appeals, then state habeas, and now coming to us and wanting more experts upon experts and looking at those issues. That, that's what most of the time I've spent on, on vouchers has, has occurred. Well, anecdotally, uh, Mr. Martinez indicated that he thought that uh, about the fee structure, I think in response to what he said, I would say that there, anecdotally there are issues of U.S. Attorney's Office paying up to $1,000 an hour for psychiatrists. 
no one in the federal public defender's office or in the CJA is ever going to pay a thousand bucks an hour for a psychiatrist or a psychologist or any other expert witness. Mr. Walton had a follow-up. Yeah, I mean, Judge, you know, what we've heard from some panel lawyers is that uh, the reason we as judges don't hear uh, 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 about objections that they have is that they're fearful of raising those objections because they also rely upon the judges to appoint them to cases in the future. And we've also heard that many lawyers uh, will not ask for money uh, above what the maximum amount is without other approval uh, because they're fearful that they will be cut. So they just, even though they believe they're entitled to more money, they don't request more because they uh, fear being uh, having that amount reduced. Uh, again, I've not had that. First of all, I don't appoint the lawyers. My magistrate judges do because I've got two courthouses that are about three hours apart from each other, or actually an hour and a half apart from each other. And so the magistrate judge in the PACUS division does all the appointment because they're, they're doing the initials. Uh, the same thing happens in the Midland Odessa division of the Western District of Texas. My magistrate judge does it because he's doing uh, all the initials, in which case that, that's when uh, judge, I mean, lawyers are appointed. Uh, so it's handled that way. In the PACUS division, uh, if it's, not a con if it's not a conflict situation, where, for instance, you have four illegal aliens coming in together or four what we call backpackers bringing in uh, drugs across the, the border, public defender gets the public defender's office, again, which we only have four lawyers in that office, but they get number one appointment. Then the next three or whoever's next on the list. And so the, the magistrate judges don't do the vouchers. I do the vouchers after the case is over. So at least in my situation, I don't think that would be a legitimate uh, complaint. So, Judge Janelle, just to follow up a little bit on uh, Judge Goldberg's questions, and, and you indicated uh, concerns or issues with respect to capital habeas, uh, and you talked specifically about experts. And I, I was trying to make sure I understood a little bit what you meant. Were you were you saying that the concern was the availability of experts to come in and review or the costs and necessity associated with experts coming in and reviewing? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Could you amplify on that a little bit? <laughs> I think more the latter than the former. I mean, and again, uh, and they're not, it's, I'm trying to think. I have two pending right now, and so these are fresh on my mind going right now. They're at, the, they're at the circuit, I mean, but I've had them in the last two years. And so, yes, those have been cases which um, I've been concerned about the cost of experts as well as the cost of and where they're, you know, where they're finding them and where they're, you know, that, that sort of, that, the nature of those things. So, yes. I'd be glad to get out of the habeas business. Let me tell you, if you want to take the district judge out of the habeas, let him just go straight to the circuit. That's <laughs> just one follow-up question on that. So is it, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what's going on. Is it the rates that the experts are charging, or is it the question of the necessity? Of Both. That? Both. And how do you, as a judge, looking at those requests, make those decisions? About because I have experience. I've been practicing law for bunch of years, a lot of years, and I've seen a lot of habeas cases, and I've seen, you know, seen that, and I, I think, plus, again, we're re-reviewing a record that has occurred. Uh, I'm not the first one that's seen the record on this case, as you, as you know, uh, and so it's been through both the state appeal, uh, maybe a reappeal, and then in, in Texas, we have both an intermediary court of criminal appeals and then our final court of appeals for criminal cases in the state of Texas. Then it's been through the state habeas, and now it's coming to me for habeas. So yes, I, I, I see those things uh, that I believe are redundant in many occasions. But with all due respect, I mean, isn't it the the responsibility and role of the lawyer representing the client to decide what would be appropriate in a case in terms of experts as opposed to the judge? I, I don't argue that. I don't argue that. But I think the judge has a role as well, particularly when taxpayers are paying for that. And uh, again, again, if you want to take the district judge out of that, you won't hurt my feelings a bit in doing that. But that's the, that's what it is now. And and sometimes the cost. And I I wish I could give you an amount. I I didn't come prepared to do that. Uh, but they are they are relatively expensive. It seems to me. In, within 
Well, there does seem to be one area of consensus among the judges, and that is that the taking you out altogether would be just fine with you. So, <laughs> so I guess that, that leads to the natural question that this committee is going to have to review, and, and I guess you can look at it as sort of a blue sky exercise. And so if you were creating a system, and I'd ask this to the panel as a whole, if you were creating a system where one didn't exist to administer a program like this, do you have any thoughts about how you might do that that would, would take the judges out? Well, I still think the district judge has a role in the cases before their court. And those, and I mean, the, the, the trial cases, the first level of cases, I still think we have a role in doing that. And that, uh, but I would take us out of the habeas, uh, or at least, and I think within our circuit, uh, if there gets to be an issue with that, then we're, within that. and I think this idea is that, well, the judge is going to be mad at me and he's not going to do this. I think that's, uh, I, hopefully we're not where we are. Uh, with the experience we have, that we, we would do something petty like that. I don't, I don't think that's a, you know. Judge Armino? I was just thinking, I think lawyers have an obligation to educate judges. And uh, I've been educated many times. I'm very receptive to listening and understanding why this type of expertise is needed. I, I don't have a problem with that. In our circuit uh, here, the 10th, we now have, as of uh, less than a year ago, a case budgeting expert, a resource person, who's available, she's uh, visited every district within our circuit, uh, is available to answer any questions that judges have. Uh, she's also, actually we borrowed her, I guess took her from the Ninth Circuit. She did. She's, we, we did. <laughs> you used the word borrow, but you took her. We took her, <laughs> yeah. And I think that having a resource person like that, that has a, a good handle on what's going on within our circuit, makes a great deal of sense. So, And I support that fully. I think Judge Armijo, Judge Armijo is correct. Having a case budgeting attorney who's tried cases before, who's aware yeah. of what experts cost in the area, is a much better way of, of doing it than, than having a judge do it. With all due respect to Judge Janell, I, I mean, I, I haven't tried a criminal case as a lawyer in over 30 years. Things have changed. What was a, what was a, what one could do and get away with, so to speak, 30 years ago, you can't do that now. There's a different way to try cases. It's just, things have just changed. The expert witnesses have changed. We know more about human behavior and human makeup than we did 30 years ago and things such as that. It's just a much more complex system than a judge seeing what happens in the courtroom and saying, well, this is an appropriate amount of money to pay for that. I think this goes back to the point I tried to make earlier. One size doesn't fit all. Uh, we're, we're diverse in where our districts are and where they're located. New Mexico has this incredible uh, issue of diversity of, of its population here with the, with the tribes and everything that we don't have in Texas. Uh, we have incredible distances that we both have, but that you don't have in Washington, D.C., or you don't have in New York, or you don't have in you know places like that in, in handling those issues. So l let me just ask you a quick question. Judge, you know, when you say one size doesn't fit all, um, what are your concerns? I mean, I, I understand, and that's one of the things we have to look at, because we have to look at the national program. Um, but at the same time, justice has to be justice throughout the entire United States. So wh what what is your concern? What wh How do you see that playing out as we make our recommendations? I don't want to see a funding czar. I don't want to see somebody as a funding czar somewhere in the Northeast. I mean, we can see this on the, on the I mean, I'm going to, since I'm on senior status, it's easy for me to have these complaints right now. But uh, uh, we, we look at the guidelines sometimes, and we say, well, gosh, why would we do the guidelines that way? You know, that must have been somebody uh, up north, northeast, or on the west coast that came up with those kind of ideas in doing that. Uh, in the the same, second time he's mentioned Philadelphia. Yeah, where, we're going to, where, the, where the wind comes sweeping down the plains. <laughs> so, but I, I think that we are so unique, and I don't mean it by court by court, but certainly, I mean, even within our own circuit, there is a big difference between Louisiana and Texas. I mean, that, that is historical and goes, uh, you know, for, for years. I think that we need to recognize that. And uh, again, um, it may take someone in New York City I don't know how long it takes to drive from one borough to another borough to, to get somewhere to see somebody, but the jail's there. 
out here, it may be three or four hours to drive to the jail where your defendant is located. We need to recognize that, and we need someone needs to be compensated because that's taking time away from their practice in doing that. And so by putting an artificial limit of how much you can spend in travel expense, for instance, uh, I think I, I don't think that's a wise uh, matter to do. I don't think that's I, I hate to see Mr. Martinez sit over there without any... <laughs> I have a question for Mr. Martinez, because you, you operate in a system where obviously you don't get your litigation expenses approved by judges, nor are your staffing decisions determined by anyone involved in the judiciary. Can you address how, you know, you, you've got a very different system where things do come from Washington to a certain extent, but you've also got a fair degree of local autonomy. How, how, does, how do you view the system that we've got, and how do you think it might be improved? Well, if I could state just for the record, I was very happy over there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I just opened the door. They'll walk through. Um, each U.S. Attorney's Office is uh, given a certain budget and uh, with certain uh, um, pots of money. Being that person that signs for that money and uh, obviously we try to manage it as efficient and as uh, we have a trust with the citizens of the United States. And it's, we have various formulas that we need to work by. And obviously we work by them. We have so much money put aside each year for experts or for travel. Uh, the system from the U.S. Attorney's perspective works. Now, in going to the larger question that you have as far as what could we do to better enhance a system, as I stated in the prepared statements, each judicial dis or each district needs to have some, um, some authority to make certain uh, calls, to make certain judgments. And what we're asking for is input in the system. For example, let me, uh, I started in the U.S. Attorney's Office down in our Las Cruces office. And uh, it was a heck of a baptism down there with the amount of immigration cases, the amount of reactive drug cases. And I was trying to figure out, okay, what kind of input could we give that could be helpful to the court? Well, um, you know, you're dealing with attorneys, you're dealing with that human nature, and there's some attorneys that you would have difficulty, and I'm not, I'm not speaking about any specific attorney, but I had those experiences myself where you would have trouble just getting a hold of some defense attorneys. They were always on the road, and you wouldn't get a call back until it became the eve of trial kind of, kind of thing. That could be some input that we could give to the judiciary. Hey, this person's kind of hard to get, get across to, or something else. And I, we, I keep going back to our Native American community. But we have some very special, very special qualities here in New Mexico or in the Southwest. It's my understanding that we're the only state with Pueblos, as opposed to reservations. Um, the system works when there's strong advocacy on all sides. And as a prosecutor, I realize that uh, one of the things that the defense attorney has to do is build a trust relationship with that client. And if that defense attorney doesn't have an appreciation, doesn't have a sensitivity for some things coming out of Indian country, such as um, a handshake could be misinterpreted if it's done the wrong way in some ways, is my understanding. Or if an attorney doesn't have an appreciation for the family system in a pueblo, such as the clan system. I think that can hurt. So this is some of the places that we can have some input. I, I hope that helps answer your question. Mr. Martinez, the, um, on the input, uh, I think the hourly rate presently uniformly is 127 an hour. And I was wondering, and that's certainly not comparable to, say, what Mr. Friendsley would charge his private clients. And I was wondering. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> not even close. I was wondering, do you think um, that that has an impact on the quality of representation that you and your lawyers see from uh, CJA counsel? 
Well, I can't speak to that specific number. I just don't know. I mean, I, uh, my public services has been, uh, I've never worked by the hour. Now, I'm, I'm also uh, in the National Guard Army Reserve. I currently just transferred to the Army Reserve. So the only time that I've done, I've defended people, I've done it again as a, pub, as a uh, JAG. So I don't know if that specific number works. Here's, here would be a concern that I would raise, or I guess as Chief Judge Armijo put, posed a question, I would, I would have a concern that if, if an attorney is subject to doing a certain amount of pro bono work, and that attorney has a full <clears throat> spectrum or a full plate of cases to work on, just the human nature of that, what is that attorney going to be prioritizing to do first as opposed to last? And if that attorney has to get up to the northwestern part of New Mexico or travel down to Las Cruces to do an immigration case, let's say from Albuquerque, where is that prioritization going to be? I have a question um, for Judge Armijo and Judge Collins to do with the, in, in line with that, to do with experts and when you're dealing with some of these remote languages, um, you talk about the problem of getting people to help you in the courtroom. What do the attorneys do um, that don't speak these languages? How do, the, how do you as the court, if you appoint um, someone as a CJA attorney, how do they get the people they need to help them with people that aren't speaking those languages, going over some of the discovery, doing all of those things. How is that in your court? Is there a problem with those kinds of funds? Is there a problem with finding those kinds of experts? I can share an example of a case I had a few years ago. Uh, one of the uh, Pueblos near Albuquerque uh, defendant was uh, prosecuted for possessing uh, eagle feathers. <clears throat> and uh, we don't have a certified interpreter for the language spoken there, and uh, a member of the Pueblo came forward that was uh, available to both the defendant and the uh, government um, and said he would be happy to serve as the interpreter because a defendant who had spoke some English, he wanted an interpreter. And uh, so by agreement, uh, uh, and this person was vetted, I guess, by both sides, uh, first hearing that we had, because we had a number of pretrial hearings in the case before the trial, uh, very articulate. Uh, he came into court wearing a, a badge, a gold badge around his uh, chest on a chain, and I noted that, but uh, nothing was said about it. Um, it was a very short hearing because the defendant became ill, and um, he had to go to the hospital. So we resumed about a week later, and this gentleman who had uh, come forward the first day said to me in the courtroom, Judge, I can't do this. I said, what do you mean you can't do this? I can't serve as an interpreter anymore. And he still was, had this badge around his, uh, his chain. I said, why not? Because the government, governor of the Pueblo told me I could not do this. And I said, well, uh, the authority here is this court. Uh, he said, Judge, I, I respect you. I respect this proceeding. The governor told me I can't do it. And it was very clear to me that his job was on the line. He was the probation chief for the local Pueblo. That was what his badge was about. And it was very clear to me that he was told, if you continue this, you're out. And that's the power of, of tribes. Uh, it, it, you just have to understand that it plays out in, in many times in, in hearings. Uh, so we struggled to find someone who was conflict-free because obviously another person from the Pueblo would have the same potential problem. And there was a neighboring Pueblo that spoke the same language. Uh, a woman who was a school teacher came forward. She agreed to do it, but she could only do it when school was out at 3.30 in the afternoon. So we had to adjust our schedules uh, to accommodate her. We got through the trial. We, we got through the preliminary hearings. Um, in cases like that where uh, a defendant is in custody, for example, and, and the attorney needs, obviously, to visit with that attorney, uh, we will do our best through our court uh, services uh, to find a person who is able to accompany that attorney to the detention facility and, and who could uh, translate. Uh, we certainly do that with our Navajo interpreters and certainly with our Spanish interpreters, but when you have other uh, languages and potential dialects, which are very common in southern New Mexico out of our Las Cruces uh, divisional office, uh, we absolutely do our best to find someone that can accompany counsel and to be available. 
And are they paid as experts? How do you handle that? Uh, they are paid, but uh, that's a very good question. I think they're paid on contract as a contract interpreter would be paid. Through the court? Through the court, yeah, absolutely. So the, as far as the attorney taking this person out to the jail or whatever, that is totally a court-related funding, I even when they go out to the jail? It's with my them. understanding it is, yes. In Arizona, when a, when a CJA lawyer has has to hire an interpreter, we pay for it as an expert witness type of fee. I uh, think most of our uh, CJA panel lawyers speak Spanish. Everyone in the, in the Federal Public Defender's Office in Tucson speaks Spanish, so we don't have to worry about interpreters from, for them. But but when, when a lawyer does not speak the language, whether it be Treaky or Chol or whatever the dialect is, we try our best to try and find someone somewhere in the country that speaks that language, and they get paid as, as if they were, were an expert witness. And if the if the court services interpreter is not available, we try and find someone someplace else. Do you have any problems from the circuits approving? Though you know, I, I would imagine finding someone who speaks it and bringing it in. There. I haven't had a problem getting anyone paid Never. so far. Never. 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 Um, I, I share uh, Judge Collins your 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 concerns about judges being involved in the process of appointment and approving payment because I I don't think it's my case where you know a lawyer has to worry but I think there are judges where lawyers have to be worried uh, and if we're not able to have this separate entity created that would review the vouchers or make the appointments and if we you know b besides what Judge Miles LeGrain recommended about a third judge or a third party as a judge reviewing the vouchers. Do you have any other ideas to what we could do to uh, ensure that lawyers uh, are getting adequately paid and they don't feel intimidated uh, because they are uh, asking payment from the same judge who's, who, who handled the trial or handled the case? If you if, if 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 at the end of the day they're still asking the same judge for the for the money, I think that you you, you can't really solve the problem. I think the case budgeting process works very very well. I think most of the times when that happens, the judges buy off on it. I notice what happens in the Ninth Circuit. So when that when that when that when that budget has been vetted by a case budgeting attorney, the judges seem more readily uh, able to approve it and not cut it and things such as that. So I think that's a good way of doing it also. And as as has already been mentioned, you got a pretty good one here in the Tenth Circuit that was trained in the Ninth, by the way. <laughs> We're going to remember that. And, you said and that they'd like to move to Austin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any snow in Austin on a normal basis. But uh, I, I I think somehow you just, you you just got to get the judge out of the process. I think that's I think that's as, as we all hear stories about what some judges can and will do when it comes to voucher cutting and appointing experts and things such as that. Uh, in the Defender Services budget, as you all know, the Federal Public Defender and the Defender Services budget is one big budget, and about half goes to each. But the, the Federal Public Defenders are controlling their own budget, and they get to decide how much to pay experts and whether they use an the expert or not. But a CJ lawyer doesn't get to make the decision whether they get to use an expert or not. It's made by the judge. And how much they get paid is made by the judge. And that's uh, a system fraught with peril. Have you ever heard from lawyers who uh, refuse to take uh, CJA cases because of the uh, amount of money they're going to be paid on an hourly basis? And at all, you hear of lawyers who do that. Uh, but most lawyers uh, are willing to take the cases. Uh, again, you're not looking for a lawyer who's trying to make a living doing nothing but CJA cases. You shouldn't be looking for lawyers in that, in that vein. You want lawyers who do CJA work because of the work. Good. They're, they're going to get paid for what they do, but you want lawyers who are going to make that a portion of their practice, not all of their practice. And we, we de develop into a system now where there are too many lawyers where that's all of their practice. Can I press you on that issue a little bit? Because as a federal defender, and I've been a federal defender for 25 years roughly now, you know, one of the things we count as one of our great advantages is that we live and breathe federal criminal law. You know, we are the ultimate specialists. So, you know, people ask me about something outside of my field, and I just look at them and throw my hands up. But if you ask me about an issue of federal criminal law, and beyond that, if you ask me about the judges in my district and how they're going to respond to something, I can tell you exactly. You know, I can tell you this plea agreement's illusory because it doesn't matter what the U.S. attorney recommends, this judge isn't going to follow it. So don't cut that deal. 
that kind of knowledge comes from deep immersion, and, and, we, and we credit that in the case of federal public defenders. But you're saying we shouldn't take the same approach with regard to our panel lawyers. Can you explain to me why you feel that? Well, as, I, as I said in my opening statements, I, I wish every uh, case was handled by the Federal Public Defender's Office because there you get consistency. You're going to get a good lawyer, good work, good quality of work all the time. When you go to the CJA path side, though, you're paying someone now $127 an hour. Uh, they've got, they're running an office. They're not devoting their full time to doing the work of being a, a, a from a defense lawyer, they just can't. They're running a business. They're running a practice. It's different than being in the federal public defender's office. You're not getting paid one twenty-seven an hour. Number one. <laughs> so see, As my wife often points out. <laughs> so so there is a difference uh, in terms of CJA and and and, uh, and the federal public defender. We may not be able to do away with uh, having only those people just do CJA cases because we have so many cases now. That, that require indigent defense, and the federal public defender cannot handle all of them. For instance, I, you know, when you get a multi-defendant case, you can only take one. So we're always going to have a CGA system. But I, I think having a lawyer solely depend on doing nothing but CGA work is, can be a problematic. Jeremio, you talked about struggling with panel size. Can you comment on the same issue, what your thoughts are? Yeah, we've, we've had some conversations about that. Uh, we want to get attorneys uh, on the general felony panel that, that have had some experience in the courtroom, and you've got folks on the auxiliary panel who want to come on board, and we've encouraged them to volunteer, take a day, take two days with a, another attorney, sit through their trial, a second chair, just, just let them mentor you, and we've encouraged that, but we've tried to get folks in the courtroom that, that have the experience. Uh, we've struggled with that because we've, we've heard that often there are attorneys who rely on, on CJA as their bread and butter. That, that is the focus. Uh, and I can think of two attorneys that are ranked among the high billers, you know, extreme high billers. Maybe that is the reason. Uh, I think that, that there have been complaints in our district about from attorneys, panel attorneys, not getting enough appointments. But the problem with that is the, the larger your, your panel is, the least likely you're going to be called. That's the problem. So do you add uh, a, 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 or have a large number, and, and again, we're 50%, 50%, uh, or do you try to, to reduce that to some extent, extent or through attrition and really focus on training these people, getting them uh, better qualified, getting them to understand the use of experts, how to use experts, enhancing trial skills, and and uh, and having just a, a better, well-rounded group of people to pick from, it's talked about in both directions. Um, but we are getting complaints from panel members that they're just not getting called. But it's it's the, the luck of the draw, and it's of course obviously the number of filings that, that are made by the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. Who decides who gets on your CJA panel, Judge? Henry? The committee does. And that committee is made up of. Uh, up until uh, essentially two and a half years ago, it, it was uh, strictly uh, panel attorneys <clears throat> that were uh, the committee um, select number. And uh, after discussing this topic with a number of chief judges from around the country, uh, I noted that New Mexico was really one of the exceptions that for the most part, or in a great number of districts, uh, the court has a, a, a role in the committee process, has a presence. And, we determined to uh, make that change in the District of New Mexico, and I or my designee will sit along with uh, one of my magistrate judges. And we've also uh, 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 better scrutinized the, the court has, the, the membership of that committee when we've had vacancies. And we've now uh, put on the committee uh, attorneys who have great expertise in litigation. Uh, either in, in criminal defense uh, or in, in the civil rights area, because sometimes there's a fine line between the two. Uh, and I think it has really made the committee process a better process, because we've been able to, to look at the skill factor of folks that come up on application and make recommendations. This whole notion of mentorship has been talked about and has come up. So it is, uh, there are two judges on the committee. Uh, in fact, we just went through our, our process here a couple weeks ago. Uh, so our full court will be reviewing the recommended uh, 
appointments here at our December Article Three meeting, and we do that twice a year. So the committee makes a recommendation, but in the end, the judges. Mm -hmm. the yeah, and and for the most part, we'll adopt. We have always adopted those. There may be a question or two that have come up, but if they've generally been the same question or two that have come up by the committee, where someone's sort of on the line. But that's the process. The court will will approve, uh, finalize it, at, at a special meeting. Judge Janelle and Judge Collins, do you have a similar process? Do you have a process for removing lawyers from the panel if they're not performing up to par? We have a process. As, as, as a panel similar to what Judge Mayhew has. We have um, a legal defender, county legal defender, county public defender, a state court judge, um, and a couple other people, private practitioners. They are the committee. They, they interview, look at people who are applying to be on the panel, then they give the slate to the judges. We approve or disapprove. There's no formal process for removal, but there is a process for removal. And I guess I would say that. And Judge Armijo has mentioned training. The AO has some excellent training programs, and I think one of them is going on right now, which is why we're here in Santa Fe, because many public defenders are here. Uh, that, there's training out there for, for CJA lawyers as well as public defenders. There's a lot of training that's being sponsored by the AO. A lot of it was cut when we had sequestration, but it's now come back. In our, on the admission as a CJA lawyer, we do have a committee, and um, I'm not on it. The, uh, for, because the prior division, for each of the divisions, I have my magistrate judges uh, do that. And we don't have a formal uh, process for getting someone off the CJA panel. Uh, you know, I think it becomes somewhat obvious. For, and I'll give you an example. We have a lawyer that gets indicted. Uh, that's on the CJA panel. That's, I mean, that's one. They're not going to get appointments. Uh, so, because they may not have a law license after their case is, is completed. But uh, occasionally, uh, I've talked to a couple of lawyers. Again, it never had anything to do with, I didn't like, we, we would get a client complaint and, and say, my lawyer never comes to see me. You know, somebody needs, and so I'll call the lawyer, and this this is rare, but I'll call the lawyer and say, you know, we've had this complaint. You need to, and it won't, it'll be after the, you know, or sometime we'll even be in the middle of the case, but after the complaint case has been completed, and make sure that the lawyer's actions did not harm the client uh, in any way. Uh, but talk to the lawyer and say, you know, you can't do this, and you need to, you know, be involved uh, in your client, and you know, setting up. One of the things I think would be helpful, um, of course, if, you know, I graduated from law school about five years ago, so I can remember this very well. But, uh, you know, one of the things that would be helpful, I think, would be is to have a federal criminal law 101 kind of a deal that perhaps can be, I mean, because a lot of these things, you know, I have lawyers who come in that they're handling their first sentencing, and they've never asked, uh, you know, for safety valve. Why didn't you ask for safety valve? Well, what's safety valve? I mean, some, some kind of basic, particularly a lot of what they do is on sentencings and on, you know, what's Rule 11 uh, have to do? Did the magistrate judge ask you this question, and particularly in, in, our, in the border now? Uh, did you discuss with your uh, client uh, that he is going to be deported if he pleads guilty in this case, which we all know is, is something that we all see now uh, down here on the border? Uh, and so I think having kind of a, a, a across the board, you know, federal uh, criminal law 101, I call it 101, just as something that we would have something rather than each district come up with their own or each division coming up with their own. I think that would be really helpful for getting new lawyers onto, um, into the CJ. I'm curious to know how much time each of the judges spend per week, per month, however you want to calculate it. Um, dealing with uh, or involved with uh, CJA matters. Uh, and I guess the natural follow-up to that would be, obviously, if that time was available for other things, how that could help the administration of justice in your district. Mine's pretty rare. I mean, mine's signing the vouchers. That's signing the vouchers. And we've gone to a new electronic way of doing them in the Western District. I guess maybe everybody has gone to this now. But um, it's just re reviewing... And again, don't review all the, the, the paperwork that goes with the voucher. We're reading the voucher, sign it, date it. So re regardless of the, the high volume of cases, you still don't spend a lot of time with, with the vouchers? No. Every judge has uh, his or her, her list of do's and don'ts. 
And uh, one of my dues is I encourage uh, status conferences. And so I'm very open to having an attorney call me on a CJA matter. I generally will initiate a call if I have questions about a request that's come in, especially involving experts or maybe not so much the need for experts or an investigator, but sometimes the hours that they represent. And I'm trying to figure out why this number of hours Hour, this number of hours at this point. So I do spend time on, uh, on uh, uh, CJA telephonic status conferences. I find them very productive. Do you have any idea how much time you spend? Oh, I probably in voucher have review maybe, and related matters. Maybe eight a month uh, on the phone. And uh, now that we've gone to eVoucher, I've done my training as of a week ago. Uh, so that's not going to take much time, I don't think. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm historically maybe hour and a half to two hours on voucher review, I think. I agree. There's not that much time reviewing yeah. vouchers. And, you know, on the CJ issues, when they crop up, they're not that time consuming. They're saying. To follow up with Chip's question, the uh, guidelines, the CJA guidelines, call for an opportunity for the lawyer who's going to have a voucher cut to be heard yeah. by the judge. Um, as chief judges, do you know, is that, uh, is that happening? Oh, yes. In fact, in our court, we actually, it's our policy. They, they've got that due process built into it. So, yeah, uh, they've got uh, an opportunity to be heard. It happens. Yep. They don't get uncut, but it happens. <laughs> they've had their day in court. They've had their day in court. We, we've had complaints uh, of, of, about circuit judges who, cut vouchers even though the district judge hasn't done so. Is that a problem that you all have seen? Not that not that I'm aware of. I'm not sure how I'd know about it. I send a voucher to the circuit that needs to be approved. It's hopefully approved or if it's cut, I'm not sure I'd know about it. It would then go directly for payment to the uh, to the administrator. So I don't, I don't know that I'd know. I haven't heard of a complaint about yeah. a circuit judge cutting one either. Yeah. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but I have not heard the complaint. We've had some complaints about circuit judges, but it wasn't on vouchers or things. <laughs> I mean, from judges, too. I, I have a question for all of you, and it has to do with appointing in capital habeas cases. Uh, Judge Janelle, you brought this up. Um, and I'm also from Texas, and finding counsel in those kinds of cases is very difficult, in my opinion. Um, we don't have the expertise um, in El Paso, certainly. I don't know that you have it in Midland. So my question for all of you is, when you get that kind of a case, what do you do? How do you figure out who, who's going to be the counsel to represent in those very serious capital cases? I, I don't care where we start, Judge Collins, let's start with you. When we have to point someone outside the Federal Public Defender's Office, we consult with the Federal Public Defender and get their suggestions about who should be appointed. Okay, let me follow up. Do you, does your Federal Public Defender do those kinds of cases? Yes, Is that what you're saying? they do. Okay, so explain, if you could, for all of us, how it would go first to the federal public defender? It would go first to the federal public defender automatically. They can't handle the case, and it needs to be outside the federal public defender system. They would then try and recommend someone to handle that case, and we would listen to their recommendation. Do they have a particular office, portion of the office that handles that? I mean, because you, you're in a very busy district. How, how is it possible that they're doing all these immigration cases and those? Or do they have a special unit? They have a, they have a CHU. They have a CHU set up. Okay. So it's a capital habeas. Yes, they have a capital habeas unit. And that has been approved in your circuit? Yes. And you have that as part of yours? Yes. Okay. I've not had experience with that. Uh, but uh, our federal public defender office, about a year or so uh, after many months of trial, uh, represented uh, uh defendant in a death penalty case. Um, I know of other situations where they've not been appointed. It may be they declined it or it was private counsel that were brought in, but they're always uh, uh, vetted through the Federal Public Defender's Office. They come up with the recommended names. And are you able to find people locally to do that? Uh, well, Mark Donatelli, I think, if people here that know him nationally on a national uh, level, he does this kind of work. He's here in Santa Fe, but uh, uh, to a certain extent, yes, but we also have, uh, on more than one occasion, lead counsel from out of state. And, and we know who these people are. So if, if, the, if you need someone, you just bring them in? Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and do you have any problems? counsel. And do you have any problems with the circuit when you do that? Never. Ms. Otto, what's the situation in, in your district? We have a capital habeas unit in my office, 
And uh, our district also has a special capital habeas panel with a panel selection committee that uh, is from all three districts. We handle all of the death penalty work in all three districts on the habeas level. Do you have a sufficient number of lawyers who are qualified to do that type of work? Uh, we have a sufficient number of lawyers up to this point. Um, our panel is aging. We are extremely busy. We have a lot of executions, and some of the lawyers are getting a little worn out. What are the biggest concerns you have in terms of uh, replacing those lawyers and the impediments to replacing them in the future? Qualified people, period. Uh, just because you've tried a capital case in state court doesn't mean that you're capable of doing capital habeas work in federal court. And do you think that that's, there's an absence of qualified people, or do you think that qualified people aren't willing to do the work for various reasons? The latter. And when, what are those reasons? It's extremely difficult, for one thing. It's it, very time-consuming. If you take one of these cases, it can consume your practice. A couple of the panel attorneys essentially lost their practices because they did capital habeas work. It's, it just takes so much time to work it up. We don't always get uh, evidentiary hearings in state court, so you have to do a complete, it's not like you get a good record. You have to do complete work on it. And they're expensive and difficult, difficult cases. So, it, it, and Judge Janelle, so in your case, because I'm in your situation, what do you do? We don't have a two in the Fifth Circuit. How do you find lawyers? Um, All of mine have come with lawyers. They had handled the state habeas and then continued then to just continue on. In fact, we had one group that came from California. They were part, of, and I don't want to say they were California public defenders, but somehow, I, I'm not sure that, I don't, is California's death penalty still ongoing right now? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. But anyway, they, they came from the federal, uh, and I don't say federal, they came from a public defender's office in California and are still handling the case. Now it's up at the Fifth Circuit. Now it's gone through me up to the circuit. So, so they were state, federal? I, I assume they were. I know they were from California, and I, I think they were involved with, with a, some sort of defender's office in California that um, took this case. And, um, so they just continued on? They just continued on. They had done it at the state, and the other ones I've had... We were done at the state, and they just continued it on. And it was, in Texas, uh, I think to do, uh, it's my understanding, to do state habeas uh, death penalty cases, there's a, li there, I don't know, it's not a licensure, but there's a certification program, I believe, for that um, by the state courts, by the, done by the state. Ms. Otto, what, do you have any suggestions for the, the, the problems that you that you've outlined. We're, we're actually going to have an opportunity to make suggestions to Congress, whether they'll listen or not, but we're, we're here to get your suggestions. Well, um, I won't start with the obvious, which is abolish the death penalty. That seems to work really well. Failing that, uh, I think what we need to do is start uh, some really serious outreach in a lot of different areas. Uh, People can do this work. It just requires educating them about the nuances. It is a Byzantine area of the law. It takes a lot of time. And perhaps if we offered people the opportunity to associate with more experienced attorneys and compensated them, sort of as a mentor, a paid mentee mentor program, that would be of some assistance. Um, Every place is a little bit different, and just because you know the nuances of California law doesn't mean you can hop over to Texas or Oklahoma, and it just doesn't translate that seamlessly. And I really think that we need to um, probably think about having habeas units of some sort available in every circuit. That seems to be the best model. Now, I know that there are some circuits who didn't want to do that and who haven't done that. Uh, but in those places, it is really difficult to get a cadre of qualified attorneys to continue taking these cases. Uh, capital habeas units are good for that. They will 
uh, provide that structure and training, uh, just a group of highly specialized lawyers with whom younger attorneys can associate. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Martinez, with respect to the three uh, items that you identified in your uh, written remarks and, and opening statement, uh, the second one dealing with this issue of appointment of private uh, counsel under the CJA. Um, first of all, could you speak to the prevalence of that issue or, or, or why it is that in the panoply of issues that, that the survey of, of your office could have reached out that that one became one of the issues that you spoke about and, and also maybe address what the concern is. It is, a, is it a quality concern that maybe private lawyers who are not on the panel are taking cases that they're not getting enough money to start with to, to do the representation and they're sort of backdooring their way in or is there some other type of concern that, that you have? Well, that, the latter part of what you're saying was a concern. I, uh, as I said, we've seen this on a national scope, but we also have a concern that may be happening here, but uh, I have to be candid with you. There's very little specifics that I can talk to you about because um, this is a part of the system that from the U.S. Attorney's Office we really don't have an overall perspective on. We, we have a concern at this point um, and if, if it is occurring, um, what we're hoping is that, uh, here's, the, here's the concern, is that if that private uh, if that defendant hires that private attorney, that attorney may not be qualified to be working in that area, and the court may be appointing that attorney once the money runs out. And as we've spoken earlier, with the specialized areas, whether it's immigration or other types of areas, that attorney may not be the best qualified to be appointed, but yet still jump into there by, um, that's a concern we have. And can I turn back to you to ask you a question about, you are talking about the difficulty of these capital habeas cases, difficult of, dif difficulty of getting the right people on them and costs. And I guess I'd like to know, are you seeing increasing difficulty in costs post-Martinez when there's this obligation to re-examine fully the prior state habeas proceedings? And what's that doing to your practice and to your ability to appoint people when you can't take the case? All right, that's a compound question, and I'll try to answer yes. it one part at a time to serve clarity. Um, okay, first thing, in, in the Western District of Oklahoma, we have a, a case budgeting process for the panel attorneys that goes through a magistrate judge. And it, there was a lot of sticker shock right after the first group of cases came through. Um, First post Martinez case. Yes, and now everyone's sort of adjusted to this new reality. It's important to get these cases done. In the Western District, we have one magistrate judge who does all of them. He's developed a real feel for it and a real expertise at this. Things don't work quite as seamlessly in the Northern and Eastern Districts as they do in the Western District. Uh, it seems when you have a case budget and you can discuss these matters up front, it's a lot easier to get that, get people thinking about it, get people planning ahead, and get people budgeting for this. So I think the case budgeting process really facilitates that. Um, Judge Purcell has a really good sense of what it takes to get these cases done properly. We have a very experienced cadre of uh, death penalty litigators in the Western District, and they know what it takes. Uh, some of them have practiced in state court for years. They know the prosecutors. They know what facts need to be developed. Uh, we have a pretty culturally diverse state. One size does not fit all, even from county to county. And I think that uh, that case budgeting process has facilitated that enormously. There's no surprise at the end of the case for the judge, and there's no surprise for the lawyer. You can go back and request additional funds. That's a possibility, too. Things don't work quite as um, 
clearly at the circuit that in the Western District, the case budgeting has seemed to, to alleviate most of those difficulties. Did that answer your question? I think so. Are you, one just quick follow-up. Mm -hmm. Is it any more or less difficult to get appointments, to get people to accept appointments post-Martinez, and does the case budgeting process also facilitate your ability to appoint people to the cases? Are you able to say you can get things set in advance and so encourage people to take the cases? I don't think Martinez has increased the difficulty factor exponentially. It has increased the difficulty factor somewhat. And what about the second question? Does the case budgeting process also help you with the appointment? Process? Yes, absolutely. Um, Ms. Otto, you weren't here at the beginning, and I'm sorry. so um, we've had a, a discussion about a number of things, but um, and it's fine. Uh, Judge Miles Grange was very articulate, and we've had all kinds of discussions. Um, but I guess one of the questions that was asked that you didn't have the opportunity to answer is we're, we're here as a panel uh, trying to uh, look at the CJA play program and and study its strengths, its weaknesses. And I think it was Mr. Friendly who said, you know, it's sort of a blue sky. If you, it, what do you see um, as a practicing attorney um, looking at the program? Um, do you have any thoughts about the program itself? Um, I, I guess you're, are you primarily with the Capitol Habeas Unit or is the, uh, the whole program? Well, I'm the federal public defender for the Western District. So in your, in your role as the federal public defender in this blue sky, um, what do you see? What, what, what would you like to tell us about? I think the most important thing, and Judge uh, Miles LaGrange and I talked about this extensively when she was preparing her comments, uh, the case budgeting in the capital habeas cases really started as thinking about what would make things better. Uh, I have a CJA uh, panel administrator, a lawyer who checks for conflicts and who is answerable to me but is separated physically, separated from my office and operates independently. Having that buffer between the panel and our office and the panel and the court adds a layer of transparency, I think, in the appointment process. I think e-voucher should help us if it's everything that it's cracked up to be. Supposedly, you're going to be able to put in some parameters in e-voucher that will help us uh, create a tier of panel of attorneys. We have some very, very experienced attorneys who practice in large law firms in Oklahoma City, and they just can't take certain cases. Bank robberies, their law firm represents all the banks. They can't take bank robberies. I get that. But we want to encourage them to be on the panel. We can hopefully select them out, and the panel administrator will just find exactly the right person. I think that's really a cost saver. If you can get the right person first time and get that person appointed, no conflicts, and a perfect fit, things work really well. The second part of it is the money. I think that one of the reasons the judges were so enthusiastic about having a CJA panel administrator, that person is going to do a reasonableness review. The judges who met with me all expressed how much they hate that part of the CJA process. They hate going over the vouchers. They hate having to get down in the weeds with the lawyers on how much time they spent on this, that, or the other. And balancing, when you have a multi-defendant case, these wildly disparate vouchers is time consuming and very uncomfortable for them. I think Judge Miles LaGrange and I kicked around the idea of maybe having a case budgeting process, not for complex, but just for routine cases, or maybe the CJA panel administrator and one of either our magistrate judges or perhaps one of our senior judges who's out of the criminal rotation would actually be responsible for the vouchering on all of the regular CJA work. That way, the district judge who's presiding over the merits wouldn't have to be talking to the lawyer about the money. That's a, an uncomfortable part, I think, of the CJA process. I know that I, I really hate it when I have to go into a judge who's going to be listening to my evidence and I have to ask for a subpoena. And 
it's inevitable. It's always, well, why do you need this witness? And I always end up having that conversation with them. If, there, if we had in our district just kind of a management layer that was separate from the merits layer, that would work for us. Would it work for everybody? Probably not. But either separating out in the statute those two functions or changing, as, the, as Judge Miles LaGrange said, changing the model plan and the guide to judiciary policies and procedures to give districts the flexibility to do that, I think would benefit everyone. I think the panel attorneys would like it, and I know that my district judges would love it if they never had to do those vouchers again and all that math and all that stuff. I have a question about your um, the person that does the selection of CJA. You said it, that there's a... Uh, a person in your office that actually assigns the cases? Yes. At what stage does that happen? In other words, um, you've got an, a person who's arrested, ready to appear before a judge. Usually, you know, they're going before the magistrate, and the magistrate will appoint. Um, how? At what stage does your uh, employee get in there and say, okay, there's no conflict here, we're going to appoint this person? How does that work for it? Could you explain that for us? I sure can. The CJA panel administrator is notified sometimes ahead of time by the United States attorney that they're having a big roundup and warns them, I've got 10 people coming in, five non-English speakers, three people, and sometimes they know up front that there's a conflict with their office and they'll say the federal defender can't take this one. If we can take it, then we just take the first person who's arrested and who comes into the building. The marshal service lets the CJA panel administrator know when the people actually get into the marshal's holdover. The CJA panel administrator goes over there and assists the person filling out the financial affidavit to make sure that it's filled out completely, then takes it to the uh, courtroom deputy of the duty magistrate judge. This process should take about 20 minutes. Then the appointment process starts. So we try to have a lawyer over there in the holdover before pretrial services comes over to, for the pretrial services interview. Um, so that's how it works where I live. Greg Emilio and Mr. Martinez, do you have any notification system similar to that? If you know there's going to be an indictment coming down, that you will notify the court or whoever is making appointments so that they have that information available? Uh, Your Honor, we have a... Uh, I want to say we have an informal system in place where we will notify the court if there's uh, serious cases coming to, uh, uh, for example, with a, uh, if there's a large indictment coming, um, it's going to take a lot of search warrants or um, as far as pretrial services, we will notify the court so that they will be ready for the issue. Ms. Otto, what, what do you think uh, the advantage is to having the panel administrator have some connection to the defender organization as opposed to being a court clerk employee or some other type of uh, bean counter, if you will? Well, I can tell you that uh, my efforts to have a CJA panel administrator in my district work 100% dependent on them being my employee. The clerk's office said, no, they'd give me some space, but they weren't going to pay to have the, the employee in their office. They were not going to pay. <coughs> I, I think it does help. Uh, so far, it works well, because uh, if, you're, if you're associated with the defense function in some way, I believe that when the person goes in there and says, I'm with the Federal Public Defender Office, I'm an attorney, but I won't be representing you. Um, I want to talk about nothing but the financial affidavit. I think that helps. If it's, uh, and we have a substitute person who backs up our CJA panel administrator, it's a clerk, clerk employee. That person is very uh, hesitant about becoming too involved in the uh, financial affidavit process. Uh, some of it does require amount, a certain amount of discretion and judgment, 
and to make sure that it's filled out, it's complete and accurate. I think it's best for that to be an attorney. I've never had an experience with a, a staff member being in the clerk's office trying to perform this function. I understand that happens in some places, and I also understand that there are some federal public defenders who think it's just crazy for the federal public defender to have anything to do with this process. Um, and there are really two schools of thought. Part of it is just our history. When the office was established, the first federal public defender asked the court, what do you want me to do about this? Do you want to continue with the judge's courtroom deputies doing this process? Where do you want me to help? And of course it was unanimous, no, you do it. And uh, we did that for the whole state until we established two programs. Um, so it's partly history with us. There may be another model that works just as well someplace else. I do think the person needs to be an attorney, though. I'd like to see, um, and we'll start again with Judge Armico. Is there anything else um, that you would like to tell us um, today? What surprised me a couple months ago when I was interviewed by two representatives from the AO Defender Services was that uh, uh, they provide training upon request. And I don't think anyone on our court knew that. Uh, we have a pretty healthy bench and bar fund. And uh, we uh, uh, put together uh, CLEs. In fact, we did one just a few months ago. And we do it with the idea of having a component that would be attractive to the uh, criminal defense practice, one to civil, and, and then one on just good skills, evidence. Uh, we had a section on sentencing guidelines, so we do that, and we're very conscious of that. It's very well received. We do it down at the convention center in Albuquerque, and uh, it, it's extremely well received. That's our bench and bar funds that go to that. Judges uh, participate, all of our judges, actually our magistrate judges, our Article Three judges, and uh, we bring in speakers, but it surprised me that there were resources available through Defender Services that I was not aware of, and none of my judges were. Uh, judge, if you need a training in this one isolated, focused area, just let us know, and we'll come down and do it. That was just a gift. And so perhaps better communication uh, to the courts uh, about what is available, I think that would be tremendous, because that was a surprise to me. Right. Yeah. Judge Collins, anything? I would just say that as you do your work, do whatever you can to maintain independence for the uh, defenders. That they need to be seen as not part of the system, but separate and apart from the system. When you say that, you mean separate and apart how? Um, well, what's the concern? There's always this thought a client, if he's getting, if the lawyer's getting paid by the government, he must work for the government. Therefore, he's part of the government, even though he's, he's called a prosecutor, he's called a defense lawyer, but they're all the same. We've got to do something to promote independence so people don't look at it that way. It's transparent, but people don't look at it that they're all money out of the same barrel. Judge General? Well, I've heard some great ideas today, and I think, uh, I think, go back to one size doesn't fit all and that we need to give some options. I, I've heard a lot that perhaps Judge Cardona and I can go to our chief judge and, and talk about and, and have some discussions within our own district. Um, and I think that's when you publish some of these ideas to get some of these things out would be really helpful because I'm not sure, um, you know, we have a wonderful public defender in the Western District of Texas. They may not be aware of what's going on in Oklahoma or going on in other places that can be can be really helpful. So I, I think trying to get these ideas out and, and letting us know to try to make this, you know, keep the system uh, where it's supposed to be. Really good. Well, so I'd ask a follow-up question to both you and Judge Armijo because I don't disagree with the concept that having more information would be wonderful. Why, why don't we have that information? I mean, what, what, what could we do to make people more informed about the system and the things that are available to the system? Any thoughts? I mean, why, where do you think it's, where do you think that blockage is occurring that, that all this information isn't being shared? Well, I didn't know there was a complaint about uh, court-appointed judges and judges doing their vouchers till I read this article, I mean, till I read the, the, the article that came out and, and it's very, uh, 
the NACDL articles are fine. Uh, yes, the NCS. And I, I th you know, it was interesting to see. I said, why well, have that? And I understand that. But, you know, you see things there that perhaps, yes, it's maybe happening in Pennsylvania, but uh, <laughs> it, it could be happening. <laughs> it, could, it could be coming to, to Texas, uh, you know, as well. So I think sharing uh, these ideas, and I'm not, um, again, even within our own district, what Judge Cardone has in El Paso is completely different uh, or to her division there is some completely different to what I have in the Pecos division, which is right next door, just simply because of space and numbers and things of that nature and, and population. Judge Dunell, you're officially invited to our Philadelphia hearing, and I will show you, <laughs> show you around. I want to be there when the when the Eagles play the Cowboys, okay? Because <laughs> neither one of them are doing very good this year, so. <laughs> Mr. Martinez. And that is a sentence. <laughs> Mr. Martinez, anything Your Honor, you'd like to add? I just want to briefly thank thank the uh, committee, the panel again, for letting me speak before you this afternoon. Uh, I would just mirror that what uh, the Chief Judge Armijo has already said is uh, education is important. Um, one of the very nice things about New Mexico is we have strong advocates on both sides. Our, you know, the, All parties will advocate. But we also realize that New Mexico is smaller, and I think we come together as a group. For example, the federal bench and bar, or the uh, bench and bar conference that the chief judge uh, referenced, that was a place where a lot of the community came together for some wonderful education. And where I think I see that, uh, for example, in the future, is uh, one of the priorities that the Department of Justice has is for reentry programs. And that's for people coming out of incarceration. How do you keep them being solid citizens once they come out of our Incarceration. This is one of those areas that, from the Department of Justice perspective, U.S. Attorney's perspective, we are hoping to uh, help bring defense counsel into where we want to go in the future to, to maybe educate on what a reentry program is, something to that. And Ms. Otto? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Ernie. Well, I was going to say that uh, so much of what we're, we are exposed to is anecdotal, and, and that's not always a good thing. I appreciate the, appreciated the visit from the two representatives from the AO, um, and I also appreciated the time that our judges spent with uh, your former case budgeting person from the Ninth Circuit. I think the more direct contact, I mean, our court's very receptive to that. Presentations directly to the court, I think that would help to bridge the gap. How, how long have you been uh, a judge, Judge Armijo? Uh, Fourteen years. And how often has someone come and communicated like that to you in those 14 years? In, in what sense? Well, you said that somebody came from the AO. Yeah, and, and this happened, uh, you know, uh, I got the call probably 10 days before they came. They met with Mr. McHugh and, and certain public defenders. Uh, they met with our clerk of court. They met with our CJA administrator at the court, and they met with me. And one's on... on uh, is borrowed from California, who's in Washington. The other's uh, full-time with the AO, and I don't recall their names at this point, two women. And uh, I invited my clerk of court to come in and sit in through the meeting with me, and I learned a great deal. I was very receptive to it. Yep, can we take some time to meet with you, Judge? Absolutely. Uh, I think more of those kinds of outreach, uh, it will be well-received. But how many times would you say that oh, kind of outreach has happened? Only time I've, well, it hasn't happened since 12. Uh, that's when I became chief, and I don't recall it happening as a member of the court over the many years, uh, really at all. And so, so much of what we get is anecdotal, and that's just not the best way to, to do business, in my view. Ms. Otto, anything you'd like to add? Just very briefly, I, I think Chief Judge Armillo has just uh, hit on a very important point here. Um, you know, the last time, other than cyclical audits, the last time someone from the AO has come to Oklahoma City was during a bombing. That was 20 years ago. Uh, there seems to be a huge disconnect between the people in Washington and what goes on out in the field. Um, I think that if we had more communication and it were clearer to the folks in Washington that the Federal Defender Program is operating responsibly. If you saw us in the field, if you saw what we do, if you saw how hard the lawyers work uh, day in and day out, you would have no question about the money being well spent 
and the management of these offices being responsible and responsive. Uh, I think there is a disconnection between the administration and the people in the field. Uh, I would love to see that change in a very, you know, in a positive way. I think that the administrative office has a lot to learn from the folks in the field. We had a small taste of that when we did our workload measures, and uh, one of the people who was uh, participating in that actually came to the offices, came to various offices, and watched what we did and how we did it, and was convinced that we were doing a responsible job with the public's money. Um, the CJA is a such an important program. Um, I can't, I personally can't imagine what federal court would be like without it. I know that the judges in the Western District, some of them remember what it was like before it, and they didn't like it very much, and because uh, it was literally catch as catch can, and this is just too complicated and too important and too consequential to leave that to chance anymore. Uh, I think that if we just fine tune the CJA, we can move it forward. Uh, and I think part of that is making the administrative office a full partner in this instead of a thing that exists in the removed. Well, on behalf of all of the committee, I want to thank our panel, our first panel, um, for our, your participation today. We are going to take about a, we're scheduled for a 15-minute break, but it's going to be more like a 10-minute break because we're going to resume at about 3.30 with another panel. Um, but I want to thank you all for being here, uh, for your travels here, and your participation. And we may be following up with some of you because we're really trying to get to all of the issues. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.